marijuana, a weed, pot, dope, all of these things it is known by in today's American society. But what is not known are the obscure roots of this plant in our nation's history. You see, pot has not always been considered the bane of polite society. It has only recently become a controlled substance in human history. That is, within the past century, in over 9,000 years of documented marijuana use by humans. This historical precedent is evident in American history, even from its very beginnings. The first legislation passed in America concerning marijuana was put into effect in 1619 in the Jamestown colony. However, quite surprisingly, this law did not do what most modern Americans would have expected it to do. Attention, fellow citizens of Jamestown. We have a new crop. We have a new crop that needs to be planted. I know you guys all like your tobacco, but honestly, we've got some other things we need to plant too. We gotta have priorities here in Jamestown. So the Virginia company has decided that we are going to start planting hemp as well. And this is required, a mandatory crop for the planting. Do you all understand? Now, get out to your fields and plant that hemp. And so the seeds of marijuana were first planted in the Jamestown colony. However, the plant was not used for the reasons that many of us today would assume. Its fibers were wound together to create rope, an important naval store in early American history. It was also made to make clothing so that fair Jamestown maidens could deck themselves. And so the noble farmer continued to harvest his hemp under happy auspices until the arrival of the Mexican Civil War around 1910. The tensions and clashes between the Americans and the Mexican rebels led to significant Mexican hatred in the United States. Compounding this racist resentment was the hatred felt by small American farmers toward large farms that exploited cheap Mexican labor. Sadly, amidst this hatred, the hemp plant was caught in the crossfire. The Mexicans were culturally tied to the hemp plant and the smoking of it. In a racist effort to lash out against them, the state of California banned pot. Several more western states followed suit. Now, this all occurred in the west. But what about in the east? Racial motivations snared the honest little weed there as well. This time directed against blacks. Marijuana and jazz traveled hand in hand with blacks up from New Orleans to the greater eastern cities such as Chicago, and New York, and it quickly became integral in the jazz scenes there, memorialized by such artists as Louis Armstrong, Cab Calloway, and others. As much as whites in the West targeted MJ to strike at the Mexicans, Eastern whites launched a campaign against marijuana to antagonize the blacks, portraying it as a dangerous drug that emboldened Negroes and prompted them to ask that much feared question, where the white women at? Beyond this, White cited the ancient reports of Marco Polo, which stated that those who consumed hemp entered a crazed state of frenzy and were capable of mass murders. Thus, the reputation of dope was scarred in the East, but the shackles were not yet fitted round its leafy ankles. Unfortunately, business was afoot at the federal level to do something about the weed, which had attained a newfound infamy almost overnight. Though the Tenth Amendment restricted a direct ban on marijuana, legislators circumvented this with the supposedly revenue-motivated Harrison Act of 1914, which levied a federal tax on pot. This was a small victory for the man. However, 
with the introduction of Harry Anslinger into the new Federal Bureau of Narcotics, things really got sticky for the herb. <sighs> Yay, here again at my humdrum dead-end job. <sighs> I click my pen. What useless markings will I make today? What's this? Get out! <sighs> Marijuana. What is this? What will this do for me? It will do nothing for me. Marijuana, all it is, is some other piece of paper put in front of me. It will do nothing for me. Nothing will. Nothing will slake the thirst of my ambitions. Nothing! Wait, marijuana. Let's wait a second. Could I use it to my own ends? <gasps> yes, I could. I could make a big deal of it, even though it's not a big deal in itself. Out, out, let us go. Let us remove these trappings of bureaucracy and get ready to put the beat down on the weed. <sighs> As if Anslinger were not enough, another prominent U.S. citizen also set his sights on marijuana, a plant whose users and whose cultivations ran entirely counter to his own interests and profit. This weed, it puts in danger all that I own, my trees, that makes my paper, that makes my money all to be replaced by the hemp plant. But wait, who is this that comes to be in my hour of need? Harry Anslinger, I see all that you own. Your trees, your money. It is the fault of the doobie and the hemp from which it grows. We must quash it out. Yes, quash it out. This evil coalition now formed soon succeeded in passing their 1937 Marijuana Tax Act through Congress, which levied overwhelming taxes on the sale of pot and essentially outlawed the drug in the U.S. This begins the dark era in pot's history in which we are now mired, with the weed illegal and a controlled substance, while simultaneously being socially stigmatized. And so now we seek out one who has lived through a great deal of what has been come to be called the weed prohibition, and we talk to him to see what it has been like living with weed as a controlled substance. All right, so while you were growing up in the 50s, 60s, and into the 70s, I suppose, um, what was the uh, social social feeling towards marijuana, the, the attitude towards it? It was basically a, uh, a forbidden drug. It was... It was uh, Certainly, there are people that used it, but uh, we didn't uh, know anything about it. I think maybe I knew that Gene Krupa was a, a drummer, was uh, uh, arrested with marijuana in his car, and and G, uh, what's his name, uh, Robert Mitchum, the actor, was arrested uh, for marijuana possession, which was serious at the time because most of the uh, studios had uh, morals clauses in their contracts. But uh, for the most part, uh, growing up and going through high school, in 1964, when I was a junior, as you are today, marijuana was, uh, we knew that it existed, but we didn't know anybody that used it. It wasn't prevalent in the culture. It wasn't uh, spoken about. It was just, you know, okay, well, you know, a reefer madness. And was, that, was that feeling still around, the whole, uh, the hyped up effects of marijuana? Killing people and going mad, and uh, initially, and they, you know, of course, when uh, when the culture started uh, turning to uh, high uh, marijuana usage, 
they tried to use that, you know, to scare you. Oh, it's a gateway drug. You know, we'll all become heroin addicts. And I mean, it pre it prevailed uh, in, through my senior year in 1965 until just towards the end. And um, but the the prevailing attitude even then. Uh, Dave and I never told our friends. We did this on the very, very down low. We'd go into closets, you know, we'd put the stuff, the towels under there. If anybody came over when we were, in fact, high, we would always blame it on beer consumption or, you know, we would try to pass it off as something else because, you know, we, it was kind of a, you know... Beer consumption was more acceptable? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it was just alcohol. Oh, just but, alcohol. Uh, you know, drugs. Ooh. Drugs hadn't hit the big time, and they didn't until... Uh, you know, 66. So in a mere two months, we had gone from, you know, let's keep this quiet, to, hey, everybody, I got my roach clip here. Uh, you know, and of course, that was, uh, was that the summer of love, or was that 68? Uh, in any case, that was, a, that was when it really shifted. I mean, you know, it was just, it was out in the open then, and everybody knew about it. Hmm. By the time I got out of the Army, uh, and my last duty station was West Point in the summer of 69, where I was able to go up to Woodstock. So I saw that uh, it was over, you know, it was over. The culture had gone to pot, literally. Mm. And uh, did you guys have any notions of why it was illegal? Did everybody think that it was just uh, caused by madness and psychosis? And then the argument was, and it always has been, oh, well, you know, marijuana. They use marijuana, then they'll go on to the harder stuff, uh, which I never did, at least not in a serious way. <laughs> right. So go ahead and talk about the pin. Uh, the pin. This is a uh, yes on 19 pin that I have kept in my little box of memories. Uh, it was the first uh, initiative, California initiative, uh, to attempt to decriminalize marijuana. It was probably 1974, so you can see how quickly things evolved. I mean, from 64, where you know, nobody really talked about it, to 74, just a decade later, when they were trying to make it legal. It failed, of course, but, uh, you know, there's a movement, and it's, it's fairly a sustained uh, movement up to this day, uh, you know, continuing the efforts to decriminalize it. So was there a cultural shift where people became aware that it wasn't actually as nearly as bad a thing as people said it was? Yeah, I think that pretty much uh, became obvious with the use because too many people used it and you really didn't become heroin addicts or, mm -hmm. you know. Now, you have expressed a desire to uh, incriminate yourself a little bit less here, so I'm going to ask you the question that you have asked me to ask. Do you still do drugs? Well, as you know, I do not. But, you know, this, this kind of goes to the old scare tactic of, you know, leading to harder stuff, becoming addicted. And, you know, during the 60s, after I got out of the Army especially, and I was going to college, I, you know, I could be classified as a pretty hardcore space cowboy. And I tried pretty much everything that came down the pike. But when you guys arrived, when your sister was born, by that time I had, you know, maybe smoked a little with my brother when we played golf, but uh, not so much. And, and I just figured I should stop so that I could set a good example for you. And now the only things that I uh, engage in or the only illegal substance that I smoke are Cuban cigars and then I drink some single malt scotch, but uh, no, no doobies for daddy. Mm, what a shame. Yes, yeah, what a shame. However, you're going to college soon. <laughs> and so we see that weed has gone from being an economic boon on the country to a social menace. And with legality being still somewhat unlikely on the horizon of America's future, many American citizens are forced to enact rituals of the strangest sort in order to keep secretly the spirit of the weed alive to this very day.